Hey, nerdy knitters, welcome to another episode of the Nerdy Knitting Podcast, where we answer your knitting questions, chat about knitting in the news, and I share a little bit about what's on my knitting needles. I invite you to settle in with your favorite beverage and your knitting, and let's chat about knitting. Everything we discuss will be linked down in the video description box below the video. Now, before we get into our knitting news, I just want to say thank you so much for all of the wonderful comments you've left the last few weeks on the podcast, especially two weeks ago when I asked about your thoughts about what you wish you had known when you first started knitting. I've got a video coming up about that and I wanted your input and there were so many wonderful comments left. So I've been grabbing screenshots of all of those and they'll be in that upcoming video. So thank you so much for your input. Now, the first bit of news is about the knitted bouquets for the Olympics this year. All of the, the winners will receive their medals and they'll also receive bouquets. And instead of regular floral bouquets, this year they are hand knit bouquets. Now, a few weeks ago, I shared pictures of the bouquets and an article I found this week shares more about the people who are knitting all of those bouquets. And it's taking a lot of work. They've created over 4,000 roses and each of the bouquets takes about 35 hours of work. And it's not just knitting, there's crochet involved as well. So it seems to be a combination of the two. I tried to get some close up shots of the flowers to get an idea of what was done, but it's hard to see from the pictures. But if you go look at this article, you'll see some more close up shots of the bouquets as well as some of the people who are behind the scenes knitting all of them for the Olympic winners. Now the next bit of news is an ongoing event that starts on February 13th, the 100 day project where you choose any type of creative project that you want and you work on it for 100 days. You just work on it a little bit every day for 100 days. And they have a hashtag, uh, hashtag the 100 day project. And it's open to all different types of creative outlets. So whatever sort of creative project you'd like to do, whether that's knitting, crochet or anything else, you can use the hashtag the 100 day project on Instagram and share along with other people who are doing this challenge as well. There's also a website for this 100 day challenge. So I'll put a link down below for that. It's in its ninth year. So it's been go going pretty strong now for nine years. So if you'd like to participate, you can use the hashtag find out more at the website. That's all for our knitting news and next is our knitting questions and answers. Now we didn't have any questions submitted this past week so we're going to continue our discussion about different properties of different fibers and what best ways to use them for knitting. Before we do I do want to say if you have a knitting question you can leave it in a comment below this video or if you're scrolling through YouTube on the weekend you'll notice that I post a picture that asks for questions for the next podcast episode and you're more than welcome to leave your questions there as well. So we're going to start this fiber discussion by talking about the most popular fiber and that would be wool. Now wool of course comes from sheep. Sheep are sheared and all of that wool is collected and turned into usable yarn. And there are so many different sheep breeds and each one has their own unique properties and traits. You'll find very very soft wool and you'll find coarse wool. It has different textures, has different micron counts. There's lots of different things that affect how wool can feel. There's merino wool which is exceptionally soft and can be worn close to the skin. There's Icelandic wool which is sticky and grabby and makes wonderful lightweight warm sweaters but they all share some very basic properties as well. Today most of the commercially available wool you'll find from Australia and New Zealand but you'll find various sheep breeds all over the world. Now the first noticeable trait about wool is its ability to felt. Of course we don't like that in our hand knit projects but it does serve a good purpose. When you make a woven wool fabric and you felt it that fabric becomes really strong and waterproof and it's so useful for so many different things. So in the non-knitting world felted wool is a great thing. Now this happens because wool fibers are sticky. There's scales that stick out on all of those fibers and when you introduce heat or agitation and moisture any combination of those three things then those sheep wool will felt. Now when wool is actually felted all of those fibers stick together and they shrink down and they become one cohesive fabric which isn't so great for a knitting project but for other things it's very very useful for hats and cloaks and different things where you want a nice good waterproof material. Now of course this felting property can be an advantage and it can be a disadvantage if you're knitting a hand knit sweater you really don't want that to felt. Other advantages of wool include that it's very elastic, it has good memory, it's relatively lightweight, it's warm, durable, it's a good insulator, it's water absorbent, it doesn't hold odor, odors, it's wrinkle resistant, it's receptive to dye, and it's even flame retardant. It will actually self extinguish. So wool is a great choice for pot holders and things in the kitchen that might 
catch on fire at some point. They will actually self-extinguish. I know a lot of people, me included, use plant fibers for kitchen items, but plant fibers will actually continue to burn, so they're not a great choice for things like pot holders where you might be putting them in the oven and they, there is that chance of becoming flammable. An actual wool pot holder, on the other hand, will self-extinguish. But wool also has some disadvantages. It's weaker when it's wet. It does need to be hand washed and cared for carefully. Some yarns can be very, very expensive, and then some can be very scratchy and coarse. And of course, there's also wool allergies. Wool is that all around great fiber that's perfect for lots of different projects. All of your sweaters and your garments, depending on the properties of the wool, some are finer and will be nice close to the skin. Some are more scratchy. You're probably not gonna wanna wear them close to your skin. You'll wanna layer in between, but it's elastic and it's lightweight. It's great for textured, fabrics and cables and it's great for rib because wool has natural elasticity it will stretch but it will hold its shape as well it's a great choice for lightweight summer garments too because it is lightweight and it's breathable so combine wool with a plant fiber and you've got something great for a summer garment as well now those sticky wools they might be a little scratchy you might not want to wear them close to your skin but they still serve a purpose they're very popular like the Farrell sweaters and Icelandic sweaters because the color work it in a sticky wool is really outstanding because those wool fibers will hold together and all of the different colors will sort of mesh together. They will sort of felt a little bit and that's something that you want in a color work sweater to keep, to keep all of those colors together and close and not loose and open and sloppy looking. So wool is just a great all around all purpose yarn that you can use for lots of different knitting projects. Then we have that special category of superwash wool. I wanted to put that in here as well because this is its own animal. Now it's definitely a wool fiber but those fibers have been treated where the the scales on the fibers are smoothed down. They're sort of coated with something so they can't stick together like you would see in like a sticky Icelandic wool that you want to use for color work. Superwash wool has taken those fibers and coated them so they can't stick together. And this changes the way that wool yarn acts. Now, the superwash process makes that yarn easier to care for, but it changes the properties. Now, the advantages of a superwash wool is obviously it's non-felting, it's really smooth, it's soft, it has good drape, and it takes dye very well. If you want to experiment with dyeing your own yarn, then a superwash wool is a great place to start because when you're dyeing wool, you are introducing moisture and agitation and heat, and those are the three things that can felt a wool. So if you want to try dyeing yarn, superwash is a good place to start because your likelihood of felting the, the wool drops dramatically, of course, where a regular wool yarn, there is the, the chance that you could end up felting all of that yarn when you're trying to dye it. Now, along with the advantages of superwash wool, there are some disadvantages, and these are the things you have to watch out for when you're choosing a superwash wool for your project. They do have a tendency to grow or sag. They're not as warm as natural wool. They need to be washed and dried on a regular basis to keep their shape. The color can fade more quickly than natural wool and it can lose that coating and end up felting like natural wool. I don't know if you've ever knit a pair of socks and then after repeated washings, you notice that that's starting to felt. It's because that coating does disappear after it can sort of melt off after it's been washed and dried or whatever, however you take care of that yarn. That superwash coating can slowly be removed and then that yarn will felt. Now the other big disadvantage you'll often see with superwash wool is people will say they've knit a project and then it keeps growing and growing and growing. That's because those fibers have been coated and they can't stick together anymore. In a regular wool, that's where you get that bounce back in a natural elasticity because those fibers hold on to each other and they keep their shape. But when you coat those fibers in that superwash coating, they can't hold together. They can't hold on to that shape anymore. So that's where you end up with that that project that ends up larger than you thought it would because superwash yarn will not stick together. Those fibers aren't sticking together, so they can continue to sag and droop and grow. When you do want this, we call that drape. When you want a really nice drapey fabric in a shawl or an accessory, superwash wool can be great because they're easy to care for. It can be a great alternative to acrylic when you want to make something for a friend or relative and you know they're not going to want to take the time to hand wash, then a superwash project can work well. But you want to keep in mind that that superwash process does change the properties of the wool. And there are a few things you can do to mitigate this. Like if you know that you're going to knit a garment, I treat it almost like I would a plant fiber where I want to make sure there's some additional structure in the garment 
because that superwash wool is more slippery and drapey. So I want to knit something that has seams or I might want to knit tighter. Like if I had two wools that are the exact same weight of yarn, the regular wool, I might knit more loosely, but the superwash wool, I might go down a needle size and try to knit that more firmly to give it some added structure and keep it from sagging too much. But superwash wool certainly has its place and it's very great yarn that you can use for easy care garments when you want something that has really great drape. It's a good choice to have. So like it's an, a general overview of wool and superwash wool. Now, if you have any questions about other plant fibers or about wool, be sure to leave them down below and we'll discuss them next week. Now, before I talk about what I've been knitting, I just want to share about this week's sponsor, which is Amazon's Audible. If you like watching Netflix or listening to audiobooks while you knit, then Audible is a great choice. I haven't been listening to any books lately. I'm sort of in between series. I'm finishing up um, Agatha Christie's Miss Marple. I think I have one more book left in all of the Miss Marple books. I've really enjoyed listening to all of them. I started watching some of the old shows as well, but I need a new series to listen to. So if anybody has any recommendations, I don't like anything super graphic, but I like all types of different books. So if you've got a recommendation for a good story or a series, I'd love to hear about it. I'm always looking for something new to listen to. So the only finished object I have is on the mannequin behind me, the Color Adventure Shawl. It's using Gage Dye Works, their whiskey in a teacup colorway on their MCN base, their Merino Cashmere Nylon Fingering Weight Yarn. Now it's a self-striping yarn with long color changes, so you get those really wide stripes, which was perfect for this top-down triangle shawl. Every time the color changes, I would switch to a different stitch pattern. I had four different basic stitch patterns that I moved through, and I would just alternate between them for the stripes, and then I finished with that big final gray section. I guess you can't really see it behind the chair, with some more texture and some eyelets, and then finishing off with a pico edge. And I have a second skein of yarn from Gage Dye Works, the same color, so I'm going to do the very same thing, but in a different shawl shape. I think we're going to do an asymmetrical triangle shawl because it starts out with the same very small bit of color and then you gradually grow and grow. So I think the next project will be another color adventure shawl in an asymmetrical triangle. Now on my needles still is my master knitting sweater. I am closing in on the end. I'm knitting the sleeves two at a time and I've bound off most of the sleeve stitches and now I just have this saddle part left to do and I'm just about ready to finish. I have to give it, I'm going to measure it one more time just to make sure, but I think I'm ready to um, reduce a few of the stitches because I've got some cable crossings here and that can tend to flare out at your cast on and bind off. I didn't bother with that on binding off this part of the sleeve because it was just the one one cable right there. So I, I didn't think it would make that much of a difference, but even that is flaring out just a tad more than the rest of the bind off. So because there's more cable stitches involved here, I probably will reduce the stitch count a little bit just before I bind off. So that's the next thing to do. And then these sleeves are all done. I felt like they took forever, honestly. I don't know why, just because I think I'm ready to be finished with this project. It's been on my needles for a while. So I'm ready to be done. So the next step is to get all of the pieces blocked. I'm going to sit down and look at, start with the back and see like if there's anything wonky stitches, because now is the time where I can take like a tapestry needle or a, or a knitting needle and adjust some of the stitches, especially if I have some cables that look a little bit odd. So I'm going to go through each of them and get them all blocked. And the next process is to seam the sweater up. So I'm going to film myself doing all of that so you can maybe do a time-lapse video where you see how long it takes to seam a whole sweater like this. Now the seaming process is not that difficult. I have to like refresh my memory. I am using some things to walk me through this because I've never actually knit a saddle shoulder sweater before. I recommend most of the time that you um, at least purchase a pattern and knit through it, even if it's just a baby size, just to get an idea of a construction. But it's very similar to a drop shoulder sweater, which I've done plenty of times. Just adding that saddle part here is the only difference. So I didn't think I needed to knit a whole pattern just to try that out, but I am using some resources. I have Ann Bud's sweater knitting book. Um, let me see what else. And I've got lots of design books on the shelf. So I've been reading through those to understand like the construction and the math and how to sort everything out. But probably the most helpful resource has been Suzanne Bryan's sweater workshop class. 
I'll put a link for it down below. Now she has different ones. They're sort of like a pattern that you purchase on Ravelry, but it's not really a pattern so much as a workshop that walks you through how to design your own sweater. She's got them from different, like she's got a top down yoke and I think she has a set in sleeve. And then the one I purchased is for the, worked from the bottom up a drop sleeve pattern. So I'm using that really as my main reference. Now, along with each of these workshops, she has lots of videos on her YouTube channel and she had done a knit along for each of them. So there's like uh, live streams where she would answer people's questions and walk them through all of the steps. So I've been referencing all of those as I've gone along as well. So if you're interested in knitting your own sweater, designing your own from scratch, her workshops are a great choice. So I'll put a link down to the one I used. And if you go on her Ravelry designer page, you can see some of the other classes that she offers. Now, they're not patterns specifically. They're like these full PDF files that walk you through how to design and knit your own sweater. She doesn't give you any numbers. She walks you through how to do the math to figure it out for yourself. And then she also recommends Ann Bud's books if you want the numbers and the math all done for you and you just have to sort of swatch and add your stitch patterns, then that's an option as well. But it's really, if you're feeling adventurous and want to design something for yourself, these are really a great choice. And it's been very helpful while I've been working on my sweater. So the next process is to block and then start seaming. And with a saddle shoulder sweater, I believe that you start with the, the shoulder seams, like a, you lay out the front and the back, but of course you're not seaming them together, you're seaming them to this piece of material here. So that gets seamed in first, and then I believe I go along the body attaching the sleeve, and then I can go from the underarm, well from the, the hem up to the underarm and then down the sleeve. I think that's the order I have to sit down and figure out and make sure that's how it's done. But the seaming process is not hard. You just, I'm just going to use the yarn that I used for the project and just take it a little bit at a time. I really want this to come out really, really nice because it is my final project for the master hand knitting program. And then all I have left to do, I need to have all of my swatches in a bag and I think all of my papers are printed and ready to go. So I just need to get my binder ready. And um, there's two final projects. The uh, uh, Fair Isle Tam was the other one. Now you have your choice. You have to do something in stranded color work and then something that introduces cables. And it's your choice whether you want to do a cable hat, a stranded color work sweater. I obviously went the other way. I did a cable sweater and a stranded color work hat. So my hat is all finished. I still haven't woven in the ends. And then you have to write the pattern that goes with each of these because they are self-designed. So my next, I have all of my notes. I think the TAM, the TAM pattern is pretty much finished. That was really easy because you just knit from the chart basically. So I need to get that finalized and weave in all the ends on that. I haven't even done that yet. I'm gonna have to sit down one night and just work on that. And then my next step will be to get the pattern written up for this. But I've basically been trying to I wrote down everything I did when I did the back and then I used that for I, I followed my own instructions to knit the front so I could make sure that everything was right. And then, of course, I decided to take out the back and do it all again. So I think most of the pattern is pretty much finished, but that's the next step will be to get this seamed up and get that pattern finished. And hopefully by the end of February, I can get that box off in the mail. Oh, and for that sweater, I'm using Knit Picks Wool of the Andes Worsted in their bare yarn. So it's not dyed at all, just natural yarn. The next thing on my needles is a gradient project. I've got it in this. I like drawstring bags for my projects. And this is a local fiber festival here in Canada, the Twist Fiber Festival in Quebec. That was my first fiber festival that I ever went to after I became a knitter. And I'm on my third color for this scarf. You can see that it's starting to get a little darker right there. Started out with the lightest color and then introduced a speckled yarn. And then I'm on this one that's like a half and half split of the dark and the light colors. You can see it's introducing more dark color there. And then I will be going into this pretty cobalt blue color. That's the next one. And then I have the other half of each of these skeins. So it'll go the other direction after I finish with all of the cobalt blue. It'll slowly fade back out to this light blue. 
So this is Amba O'Brien's Adventurer Scarf and Wrap. Now I've adjusted the pattern. I cast on extra stitches because I wanted it wider than the 10 inches in the original pattern. And I didn't quite want it quite as long, so mine will be shorter. But it is knit on the bias. You can see the those lines, those are the central decreases. They're sort of moving right along to this edge and falling off the edge. So it's knit on the bias. It's this really fun chevron. There are no rest rows in this pattern. So every row you've got to pay attention to what you're doing. There's nothing where you're just knitting across. But once you get into the rhythm of the pattern and you can see where those central double decrease lines are, then that really helps keep you on track. Because if you mess up free any yarn over or something like that, you'll see right away because that should be lining up every single time. So this is a really fun project. I'm really enjoying it. And I'm doing a very simple fading technique when I'm switching from one yarn to another. Um, when I'm just about out of yarn and ready to switch, then I will introduce one stripe. So two rows of the new color and then do another four rows of the old color and then alternate between two rows of each before I do the reverse and I work four rows of the new color and then do a, a few more rows in my final color and that sort of fades from one to the other. But the colors in this earth yarn set really make it easy to fade because they're they're sort of worked into a gradient already. There's the lightest blue, the darkest blue, and then there's one that's sort of a speckle of the light blue with a bit of the dark blue. And then this one has more of the dark blue in it. So it's very easy to fade with these because they've already sort of done the work for you. Now for upcoming projects, my daughter has requested a new cardigan with a shawl collar and pockets. It's based on a character that she has in a show that she watches. It's very simple, just stockinette with a shawl collar. So I'm using a pattern from Amy Herzog's book. I showed it a few weeks ago. I'll show it again next week. I don't have it here with me right now. So I just ordered the yarn for that. So hopefully that will be here soon and I can get that cast on once my master knitting sweater is done. And then she also requested some hand knit gloves. I've never knit gloves, so this will be a new thing. I was digging through my, my leftover stash. I don't really have a stash of yarn. I have a bin full of leftovers. And I, in there I do have a bag of like dishcloth yarn and one for sock yarn. But then I also ran across two skeins of yarn I usually pick up Peyton's Classic Wool Worsted when I see it on sale somewhere. And I had picked up a skein of red and a skein of black for a project I had planning, I'd been planning to film. And they didn't have any choices when I was at the store. They just had like the cream, red and black and navy. I can't, it wasn't very many choices for colors. Um, so I picked up the red and the black. And then at home, I'm like, what am I thinking? They're never going to, they're not going to record very well. Red is a really hard color to get right. It looks really bright on here. It's not quite that bright. <laughs> Um, and black, obviously. It's hard to see anything with black yarn. So I don't know what I was thinking when I bought those two. So I've got these two skeins of yarn that have sort of just been sitting in the bin behind me. Um, but she requested gloves and red. She loves red, so she's going to be getting some red gloves. I don't have a pattern picked out yet, but I do have the Ann Bud Handy Book of Patterns book, and I know there's a glove pattern in there, so most likely I will just use that. I will do a quick search online and see if I see something, but she doesn't want anything fancy, no textured or anything like that. She just wants plain gloves. So we will be casting on some gloves this week once I get her hand measurement and decide how long she wants the cuff. Um, if you've got glove knitting tips, I'd love to hear them. I've never knit them before, but I don't think they can be that hard. Probably just tedious with all those fingers, but so it's always nice to try something new and glove knitting is new for me. Now, I love to show knitting resources that can help you become a better knitter. And one of my favorite resources is the Monty Stanley Knitter's Handbook. Let's see if we can get that without a glare. The Reader's Digest Knitter's Handbook. Now, there's lots of different editions of this book. It's out of print, but you can find it used in lots of different places. I've got mine on Amazon. Um, I would categorize this somewhere between like the Vogue Knitting reference book and Principles of Knitting, which is that big textbook style that I showed a few weeks ago. This is sort of the in-between book for me when I want lots of different choices of things to look on like like she'll have a section on cast-ons and there are lots of cast-ons in there and she sort of divides them up about when you want to use them in a little section at the beginning of the cast-ons um, there are some pictures not as much as you'd see in Vogue knitting but it has very clear text step-by-step -step text it does have some photos 
and there's just a lot of good information in here. So it's a really great book and a great resource to have on your shelf if you want something that has a good variety of knitting techniques. Now, I think it's easier to follow than the principles of knitting in, the, in that book. She has her own terminology for things. There's, there's still some of that in this book as well, but I just find it easier to understand in this one. This one's probably right up there with Vogue Knitting as probably my top two favorites when I'm looking at techniques those are these are probably the first two books I go to Vogue Knitting the ultimate reference book and this one now this one I think probably has more of the different techniques like you'll see like you flip in in Vogue Knitting to see the different cast ons but this one has more cast ons um, Vogue Knitting has a bigger design section I'm not even sure this book has anything about designing but it's all lots and lots and lots of knitting techniques and how to's and how to do mitered corners or pick up stitches for borders and the many different ways you can do that. So you can choose the right way to do it for your project. She just shows you all of the ways you potentially could do something. But then it's up to you to decide which one is the right choice for the project you're working on. So this is really a good book. It's a bit dated, but the information's solid and really, really worth it. Now, just a quick announcement for the Fixing Your Knitting Mistakes course. You should be on the email list if you want to hear about that. I was hoping to start recording videos for that last week, but we all caught COVID here. Um, we're all perfectly fine. I'm just still a bit stuffed up, so not the best voice for recording videos right now. So I'm hoping my nostrils will clear out a little more and then I won't sound so stuffy and I can start recording those this week but hopefully by mid-February we'll be ready to launch that first class and I can get your feedback on how things should progress in the course so join that email list uh, you'll find a link for it down below if you want to hear about more updates about the course that's all for this episode of the Nerdy Knitting Podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. If you have questions that you'd love to discuss in an upcoming episode, just leave them in a comment down below and we'll talk about it in the next episode. And if you'd like to catch up on past episodes, I'll put a playlist right here and I'll see you in that next video.